It is a nice shirt, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Um, okay. <laughs> it's been quite a ride so far. <laughs> um, let's see if we have a bit of a quorum here. Still waiting for Meta, it looks like. She's here. She's no, here. Okay, good. Yep. Okay, good, good. Okay. All right. So we have a lot of folks on. on. This is awesome. Uh, okay. So a lot to talk about. But as always, the one thing I would like to keep constant, we may change up the, the format today a little bit. Um, but uh, the one thing I would like to keep constant is beginning with the, the dev update. Meta, do you have an update for us? Uh, Greg, before we begin, I need to put this out here that I have to leave um, uh, 15 minutes after the hour. So if we spill over this this go around, I have to leave 15 minutes after the hour. Yeah, no worries. We'll, we'll, we'll keep it to the hour today. That's not every week. But yeah, I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, no worries. We'll, we'll keep it to the hour today. Perfect. Okay. Hello, All right. everybody. Can everyone see my screen? I can. I can. Oh, terrific. Well, firstly, happy Halloween, everyone. Um, one of my favorite <laughs> holidays of the year. Uh, all right. So uh, we uh, so here to present the development update. Um, so I've got some good news and a little bit of not so good news. So the good news is, is that um, we did node testing on Tuesday. Um, we were hoping to be able to relaunch the testnet. We ran into some technical challenges in that uh, some of those persnickety bugs, uh, the non-deterministic bugs that we had been observing, cropped their head up again. Um, the good news is, is that uh, thanks to Michael Birch, we did find the root cause of those bugs. And sure enough, they were related to validator bonding. We started seeing them after validators started bonding under the network. And it was that the justifications are not matching the bonded validator set. So there's this weird race condition that happened where as you're bonding validators, um, how those new, newly bonded validators got into the justification tree and created that, uh, that uh, those, some of those deterministic errors. We, are, uh, we have a fix. It's already been merged. And so this caused the clique safety oracle. We are hoping to retest on Thursday, if at all possible. I think Kelly is trying to wrangle a node testing Thursday session so we can verify the fix. Uh, I would be, I, I'm very hopeful that we can uh, knock this one out and, and relaunch testnet. So that will make the testnet significantly more stable. Uh, rolling team, uh, Peak is designed. We need to do the R space implementation for Peak. That is really the lion's share of the work. Wukash is uh, meeting with Kyle and Mike Stay to flesh that out and make sure he has a good, uh, good understanding of what needs to be done in the tuple space. Uh, stack safety, the serialization, and the interpreters merged. That was a very big ticket. We had 21 story points. We rarely do those, but this time we couldn't break it up. And Artur uh, was very happy to put that in the rearview mirror. So that's, that's really good news. Uh, Mateusz implemented interpolation in Rolang. Um, this is a nice feature that um, makes the language simpler and more delightful to use. So all you Rolang developers out there, Joshi, Dan Connolly, you know who you are. Um, take a look at that and looking forward to hearing your feedback. Um, he's now, um, Mateusz will continue to work on the short leash deployment. Um, I said that it was on track for this sprint, but I discovered that there are national holidays in Poland. So a lot of the devs are taking some time off. So it might roll over to the next sprint, but short leash deploy is high on Mateusz's list. So he'll be working on that next. Uh, the Casper team, uh, most of the contracts have imported to remove the use of unforgeable names. We still have to look at the forwarder for bonding. Um, that's not written down here because I came to learn of it after I completed the status report. But the forwarding, uh, the bond forwarder also uses forgeable names. So that will need to be upgraded. We uh, added a ticket to address that. We also completed the security review of the, of the person mint contract. We have some work to do there. Um, that is that is captured in a ticket as well. Mike Birch has a good understanding of what needs, needs to be done. Um, time on the blockchain has been implemented in Rolang. This was a precursor for doing unbonding. So we got that implemented and merged. 
And like I said, the team is focusing on the non-deterministic bugs that are affecting stability. We have a pretty good idea uh, of, uh, of, of one of the core issues. We also are seeing that the network is really chatty in that um, sometimes nodes that are waiting for an approved block get the wrong approved block. And then this also creates issues. Um, and there's also issues with invalid blocks getting passed around. So we want to implement a few stability fixes to really make um, the system stable, uh, first and foremost. So that's what the Casper guys are going to be focusing on. Storage team. Um, I tested the removal of the sync var, um, showed significant improvements um, in performance on replay R space. As I had mentioned, replay R space was seeming to be depressed at about 200 com Calm events per second. Wukash removed the sync, one of the sync vars, and uh, I now see that replay R space uh, calm event reporting matches pretty closely to deploy. So that's a very nice performance improvement that will shorten the amount of time it takes to process transactions on replay. So I'm very pleased with that. And uh, Wukash is looking at additional sync vars in addition to the peak work. Um, we completed the initial work to support separate thread pools for R space. As, as we know, we have a thread pooling issue in the node. We need to get kind of on the same page. So that work is progressing. And we're doing more benchmarking and testing to measure performance gains and opportunities. So if you look at the network performance page, I'm trying to track uh, GitHub iteration over a uh, GitHub release over GitHub release. Not every single Git hash, but periodically we try to test the performance and I try to provide some Grafana pages, the Grafana screenshots. So you can see the way performance is improving. Um, and we're, again, continue to investigate differences between propose and replay, and then continuing the investigation of Genesis block performance. We know that, you know, looking at the Genesis block is slow. We have tickets planned for the next sprint to really uh, kind of shine a light on how, how uh, what the performance is in processing the Genesis block. We know there's a big bottleneck there. I created a unit test, um, basically an integration test in collaboration with SRE, Tom Vasile, uh, created a bash script for me that will enable me to basically spin up uh, a genesis ceremony with four nodes two nodes that are bonded two nodes that are unbonded go through the bonding process go through the synchronization process and this will enable me to continue testing as we make improvements right in terms of block passing state synchronization and bonding and unbonding so um, good progress there uh, SRE team is continuing to support launch of, uh, you know, relaunch of testnet. And I assume they're also working on their production engineering plan. Um, Rita, if you're on the line, you can confirm that. Um, we're addressing failed integration tests. We're making a lot of changes rapidly to the code base. We've got integration tests that are failing. This is good. They're doing their job. Um, but somebody needs to go back over them and make sure that we understand why they failed and make sure it's not deterministic or a new bug. Uh, working on ELK. Um, Elk is basically to support collection and analysis of log data. We discovered that once we had a test net, if a test net validator had a failure, we couldn't identify what it was. And we want them to be able to configure sending us their log data um, automatically. So this has been kind of in de design and analysis, and we're getting closer to knowing what needs to be done there. Uh, moving our song to continuous integration, that work is also in process. And again, more work on benchmarks, metrics, and performance tests. I would expect that, um, you know, so as a side note, the development team has been presented with contracts. I'm sure Greg will be discussing this as part of his update and will be moving from the Pyrofix infrastructure over to the AWS and cooperative infrastructure. The SRE team will have to lead this charge and there will be some work that they will need to do. Um, this will present a small hit to the project as all of the CI work moves off of Pyrofex servers onto newly leased hardware and or AWS hardware. It'll, I, I don't have estimates yet in terms of what the migration um, uh, you know, time frame will look like. I'll work with Rita and Kelly to get those estimates, but I expect it will be at least a sprint to port everything over. It shouldn't be more than a sprint, but um, one can never say how long these things take and what kind of complexity we hit. So that's the update. And I will look at the chat for any questions. Uh, Rita so, confirms. Meta, just just out of clear, just for clarity, what is actually going to make it into um, Node Eight versus Node Nine? Do we have so, extensive feature lists? 
Um, so I have to, you know, because as I alluded to all the board work that, and, and the governance, you know, the, the, uh, member meeting that really gave, that really, you know, hit me under the waist in terms of my ability to, uh, stay on top of the planning. I need to go back over node eight and take a look. I'll be doing that today and tomorrow to see what we're, what we're looking at. Um, my sense is we might want to do, uh, uh, you know, put in a, a one week slip. Uh, give the Casper team time to address these non-deterministic bugs and get slashing and bonding, uh, unbonding in. Greg, I think you and I should sit down and have a discussion. We didn't have that during project planning today, but I think we need to sit down and talk about it. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, that's good. Good, but but you, but uh, that's that's very good news. So so Michael found the uh, the root cause of the non-deterministic bug. Yeah, I mean, it was. It appeared to be a race condition. It seems. It seems completely reasonable, right? That it's a race condition between block pass, like blocks being proposed and validators being bonded, right? So, if you think about the situation where uh, yeah, validators can, I, bonded a block, I mean, it's just really. It's like kind of like, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, I can. I can see that. Yeah, exactly. No, the <laughs> <laughs> it makes like, me want makes me want behavioral behavioral types like over and over again. <laughs> Exactly. So, um, yeah. So once, once we, and, and you know, it was like a little one line, it, it was like a one line error message in the log. It's like, Oh, okay. So the minute we saw that the light bulbs kind of went off and I fully expect that we'll see some better behavior. There's still one other bug left where there's extra elements in the replay map, but I found a way to reproduce that in my sandbox. I provided that information to Kent. And so Kent now has a reproducible test case, so I expect to be able to knock that bug out, and we should be able to test here soon. Um, I'm very optimistic. That we'll good. Get out. Yep. Very good. Okay. No, th that's that's all good news. No, that's 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 very helpful. Okay. Any other questions from the community on this? Chris has a question about documentation on time on the blockchain. I can see what I can do for you there and get something. Thanks, Meta. Mm -hmm. I know you've been asking for that recall something back in the back of my brain that you were like, oh, what about time on the blockchain? So, yeah. Okay, good. Great. Thank you. That's my update. Thank you so much, Meta. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick, up, pick up things from there. Uh, um, uh, Meta mentioned, uh, so we have uh, negotiated with PyreFX uh, to bring um, the, the dev team in-house. This is a, a good thing for us on several fronts, and I'll get to that in a minute, just to, to give people the, the timeline. Um, so the, uh, we began discussions a couple of weeks ago uh, and uh, concluded with the execution of the contract uh, somewhat late on Friday night, um, and contracts from the co-op to all the dev went out um, uh, last night uh, for them to review this morning. Uh, many thanks to uh, Bill Swan and Kate uh, for getting those out, and Meta for getting those out. Um, and then the, the dev team are reviewing them uh, and we'll be uh, having scheduling time for discussions on any concerns, questions, or issues they might have um, this Friday uh, to make sure that uh, everyone is happy with the contracts uh, that are in front of them and so we can continue with a smooth transition. Um, for the co-op, this is important. Uh, as was mentioned in the AGM and uh, other times, uh, Andreessen Horowitz uh, declined to invest in our chain. Um, I can't hear Greg. Me either. Okay. Greg, we can't yeah. hear you. Me either. He invested on services like Coinbase without having an... an Hey, Greg, you cut out there for a little bit. Can you start over um, from the Andreas and Horowitz part? Oh, you, you lost me there? Yeah. 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 About oh, Andreas and Horowitz. Okay, so Andreas and Horowitz declined to invest in our chain um, because uh, uh, the dev team was not in-house, and that was a contemplated $15 million investment. Uh, so uh, having the dev team in-house is important uh, from that regard, at least with respect to certain kinds of investors. Uh, and uh, similarly, um, we can't be listed on services like Coinbase uh, without having the dev team in-house. So it's, uh, these, this is an important move for the co-op and represents uh, uh, um, a step that we wanted to take uh, uh, um, 
and which was reflected in this nature and structure of the original um, contract with Pyrofex. Uh, so uh, the original contract with Pyrofex gave us the ability to um, to convert uh, contractors to co-op uh, contractors uh, under certain conditions. Pyrofex agreed um, to a significant discount on the conversion rate. Uh, so kudos to them for that. Uh, the co-op um, will be um, uh, 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 paying um, a conversion rate uh, in in the February timeframe as we get closer to uh, the mainnet launch. Um, also, uh, I, I, um, Nash has kindly provided a letter of intent uh, to indicate that uh, they have no they have no interest in forking the network or or anything like that. Uh, uh, it's a it's a very kind letter, and I will share that. Um, um, uh, under the uh, um, uh, the uh, <laughs> requirements of the agreement between um, Pyrofex and Co-op, but I will uh, make um, make every effort to make sure that that letter is is publicly available to all the members who are interested. Um, uh, so this ends up being, uh, uh, as I said, a significant savings, which uh, helps us uh, reduce our burn rate considerably. Um, and uh, gets us much closer to um, our target burn rate, uh, uh, which gets us uh, to uh, a mainnet launch. Um, can you be more specific about that, Greg, please? Sure. It represents about $150,000 savings per month. And this means we have runway until now? No? Uh, for the dev team? Um, if we if we um, don't count any of the other projects or efforts, we have more than enough uh, runway to get to mainnet. Uh, mainnet with uh, release in March, or is there any uh, postponing still on the table potentially? Maybe uh, Meta, if you are able to say something on that, I would be grateful. Yeah, so um, in terms of getting to mainnet by March, it all really depends in, on ter in terms of uh, the team's ability to execute and the number of developers that come over to the cooperative, right? I mean, now there's, I mean, we, so if nothing else changes, yes, but I can't, I can't speak for the developers at this point in time. Um, and, and, you know, we've hit a lot of non-deterministic bugs as well on the platform. So there's a lot. There's a lot of factors in play here, right? I mean, the original, the original plan. Um, the plan has me uh, finishing. Has us finishing by end of January. At this point in time, um, there have been nuances that have come up uh, with respects to security around unforgeable names. It's not just about being fast. It's about being correct. I think it's really important to make sure that we focus on building a blockchain that is economically secure and, 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 and functionally correct, right? That's the most important thing. Um, yeah, I've been right. calling on community members to help out with items like the sharding client. I've had some great community members kind of step up and say they're willing to take this on, uh, namely Joshi and Jake. I believe, it's, I believe it's Jake. I'm trying to remember, but I think it was Jake Gilberg and Joshi. They're stepping up to try to help us out with the sharding client because that's something that can be carved off. But, but yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of work to be done, right? We discovered we needed peak. We just dis, we've discovered you know some security issues with our purse contracts that needs to be addressed. We discovered that we needed the short leash deployment. So as we uh, and and it, and one wishes that you have all these answers up front, but we're not building something that's been built before. And so whenever you're innovating like this, it's very hard to be able to predict what you what you will encounter as you get get to that place at that point in time. So yeah, I wish okay. I could tell you guys a hundred percent. Yes. Right. But uh, think, yeah, because yeah, uh, it's, it's, un it's understood, but under the current assumptions, we're still uh, getting out the door in, in Q1 of 2019. I mean, it gives us not a lot of buffer, right? So uh, regarding this, how big is the buffer um, for, for potential things which show up during that time? So we, right have, we have, we have funds out through March. So no buffer, pretty much. Yeah, I'll, I'll comment here. It's razor thin. Um, we have to execute on, on everything, and we have to make some pretty severe cuts. But if we do that, yes, we will have what we need to deliver mainnet in the time frame we, we said we would. 
Kenny, Greg, is there any ongoing discussion with Andreessen Horowitz or others uh, that might step in with this new change? There are conversations going on with lots and lots of potential capital partners. I can't, I can't list them all on this call, but yes, there are many, many. We have not re-engaged with Andreessen Horowitz, but we have engaged with several different capital partners. And moreover, we have uh, other groups that are uh, engaging with capital partners on our behalf. So it's not just that we're talk, taking the bull by the horns, but there are there are other groups that are working on our behalf to to help us extend our reach. Is there is there anything uh, like any intents already on the table which are ripe for like speaking publicly about it? Um, there's nothing that I can speak publicly to at this time. Thanks. Yeah. But I have read the board members into all of the uh, all of the opportunities that are being pursued, and there are many, not not just one. Uh, is there any other board member there to uh, like share also maybe that the perspective on how viable this currently is and how this is moving forward? Uh, so when you when you mean by viable, you mean like yeah how likely you you like is there any like more more assessments in, in that direction how likely it is that we get uh additional funding in in the next like uh three months uh to ensure that we get a more clear runway on uh, um, the delivery of the network and on the research which needs to be done after mainnet and the development which needs to be done after mainnet yeah 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 i yeah actually tim i think it is fairly likely that something will happen but I don't think it's prudent to hope that something will happen or plan that something will just, you know, materialize because we do have a lot of opportunities. And usually when we get into further talks or diligence or for some other reason, you know, things change. So, but that said, Greg is actually, you know, there's, he's actually very optimistic most of the time about our, our, our possibility of, you know, something coming and, and completely changing the, the landscape. And, um, I'm here to to just sort of plan and do what is right in front of us with with no other um, you know sort of things in mind, and that is you know a very tight tight budget, and then that's what I'm operating to. But I do think it's actually likely within the next three months or so that something will give. I have no idea what it will be. Um, it could be any one of those numbers of things that that we have going on, either capital or loans or um, resale of technology or something else that. Um, so I, hard to say, but I'm planning with the expectation that we can't, we can't count on it. And I'm in support of what Kenny and, and Greg have just been saying. There, there's a lot of initiatives that are going on out there that are that we're all working on to try and bring the financial resources to the organization to get us way past mainnet and to make sure that we can keep the business running. So I think just instead of in addition to their voices i just want to lend my voice to that because i know there's a lot of effort right now across the entire platform towards towards bringing on the financial resources that we need right but i would want i do want to clarify a little bit of one of one of the things that really isn't an option at the moment is just selling rocket for some reason right that's not really what we're we can do right now because of the the initiatives that have passed we are constrained in that regard. Plus, the price doesn't really make it viable. So that's that's something that still might happen, but likely is not on the table anymore. Just to put that out there, Kenny. While while we're on this subject, somebody is selling rock. The price of rock is fairly low. The volumes are not super high, but they're about a thousand U.S. dollars, a hundred thousand U.S. dollars a day. Um, do we have any information on uh, where those rock are coming from and um, what's causing that? Not specifically, meaning no one has told me directly that this is what they're doing and asked for any guidance or anything like that. But I think it's pretty clear from the commentary that's been going on online that most likely these rock are as a result of, of Reflective's obligations to fund their companies. And that and they need to do that in order to get liquid resources in order to keep continuing to, to do what it is that they do. So I assume that that's likely, so, though it's not been, uh, not been go ahead, Kenny. confirmed to me. 
I, I would like to um, begin to um, put some shape back to the conversation. So uh, it's very easy for us to wander all over the map. Um, I think uh, what, what we got was a clear update on the dev, uh, where, where we are with respect to the, the, the code. And we got a, uh, a clear update with respect to um, the transition of the dev team. And we started moving into a range of different questions that are related to uh, financing. Um, I, I, I've been trying to make this point within the uh, within the um, uh, the Discord channels, uh, and similarly in a meeting that uh, 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 some of the management team had with the reflective management yesterday, which is that re re uh, regardless of the co-ops spend or the state of the co-ops finances. Uh, we have a fairly significant question with re with regards to mainnet. So even if the co-op had 20 million in the bank right now, above any of its existing liabilities, uh, we would still have um, uh, an an important um, consideration in front of us in terms of resourcing and the delivery of mainnet. And I think it would be very useful to turn a, a community attention to address that particular problem. So here's, here's the, the sort of backup plan to the validator sale that I've been thinking about for quite some time and, and voiced on Discord and would love to get more people involved. When we get to mainnet, we have to make a decision about how many external agents or parties or, or, or entities are running nodes and what is the, um, the kind of hardware that is backing those nodes, and how does that relate to the security of the network, and how does that relate to the performance of the network? So, if we take the top tier off of the validator sale, uh, we can think about maybe 30 nodes um, distributed in a two thirds, one third relationship, just as a straw man proposal. So, two thirds of those nodes are running outside of the cooperative, and they are backed by builds at, at about 100 to 150K um, per installation. So we're talking about 20, 20 like that, uh, and, or, or, or let's say even go as far down as 15 like that for backbone nodes, and then another 15 that are, uh, that are roughly half that in terms of hardware and uh, staking deploy um, for those top tier nodes in order to make the uh, to make the uh, the operational and, and uh, uh, cost uh, uh, reasonable a staking a commitment of about 250k is what I've been estimating. So what we're looking at um, is about a 400k um, uh, solution uh, for for some percentage of those nodes. So we could we could say something like a seven to ten million dollar investment, um, especially if we then include um, the operational side of of the care and feeding of uh, of the hardware and the software uh, for these uh, for these backbone uh, installations. Um, uh, Craig, can I uh, ask some questions about that? Let me finish my statements and then you can ask questions. Of course. Um, so. So we're looking at about seven to ten million dollars outside of the co-op, not under the co-op's control, that needs to be committed uh, uh, in order to have something that's say on par with AOS on some of the other networks. Um, uh, so if that's the level of security um, and uh, uh, independence and autonomy that the the community is willing to accept. If that's the level of performance that community is willing to accept, uh, then we then we have to solve that problem. But however it is, it would be really really good if the community comes together and starts defining what um, uh, what the number of nodes are relative and their characteristics uh, relative to the legal risks, the perception of performance. Uh, the security of the network, and these kinds of basic things. I would love to get to a point where we have a document um, that defines what the mainnet deployment looks like. 
um, that that there is a, essentially a referendum from the community on. Uh, and, and at that point, uh, uh, then I think we would have a much better chance of getting to Maynet. As I've said before, last comment, Tim, and then I'll turn the floor over to you. As I've said before, um, just because we've hit code freeze does not mean that we have hit mainnet. And if we do all our hardening with nodes that are under the co-op's control, then you can guarantee there will be all kinds of problems when we go live. So those are, those are uh, real concerns for us. So uh, what was your question, Tim? Uh, yeah, regarding network security, usually we have a trade-off between security and performance. So in this case, uh, we would rely on heavy nodes, I would say. So because there's a huge commitment from the uh, side of what you need to stake and the hardware requirements. Um, I would like to see a consideration uh, if we are able to maybe spawn even different networks with uh, low performance nodes, which have higher security, higher distribution, potentially run on Raspberry Pi or other hardwares, where it's more possible to have a network which is um, provided um, by low performance nodes, uh, but creates higher security through better distribution and lowers the barriers of entry. And um, yeah, I, I don't see like a um, contradictory like situation to do both potentially, but I would very much like to, to, to hear like uh, potential uh, opinions on that and if this would be something which we might be uh, considering. Well, we can, cert we can certainly provide uh, performance estimates on low performance nodes and to see whether uh, there's any interest um, at, at the end of the day, we want to be able to run dApps against these uh, these networks and low performance dApps will not support um, uh, a transaction volume that makes it interesting with respect to uh, the transaction fees or the economic uh, proposition. Um, so so it's it's kind of a you know these things go round and round and round. If the only if if the network looks something like Bitcoin, where you have basically really low volume of transactions, um, then yeah, you can you can stand up a network like that with relatively low performance nodes. The question is, who's interested? I mean, we can certainly think about GPU-based, like Ethereum minor things, right? Gaming computers, which are not that that slow. And I'm more speaking about like potential test nets we can run, uh, like prototype apps against. And give an opportunity for the community to participate in something like that. Yeah, of course. And also to explore, you know, like yes. options how we can, um, yeah, also optimize performance against not so strong nodes, which gives us uh, other options to optimize code, right? So yes, I'm all for standing up as many test nets as people have the appetite for. The question is, what does main net look like? That, that's that's what I'm focusing on. Is what what does an actual mainnet look like that has enough uh, economic uh, um, oomph uh, behind it that uh, it's going to attract the kind of adoption that we'd like to see? Any other questions here? There's some questions in the chat. Okay, so it looks like Patrick. I, actually, I have a question. Sorry, I was slow to uh, deliver, but I wonder if the if if there has been consideration of a scenario which was would be kind of bootstrapping on what Tim identified, but would be a longer um, sort of demonstration and adoption strategy. Say that ran for a year, during which time um, so certain apps might be tested. Um, you wouldn't have total performance, um, but you'd be you'd be migrating toward something. I'm I'm just I'm wondering if there is a viable scenario that's more transitory instead of uh, on off or rather off to on mainnet. Yeah, I, I think what we've been well, well I think um, there are different groups who are looking at uh, different transition strategies. So uh, what I've been looking at for quite some time is that the transition happens essentially while we are getting to the point that we call mainnet. Uh, so the hardening phase, a three-month hardening phase is there 
in order to get us to that point. Well, so and also mainnet, mainnet. Time, we would what? like to be ramped. Sorry to interrupt, but my understanding also is that there, uh, because of um, previous uh, arrangements with investment partners, there is a requirement at a date certain that mainnet um, be defined. Um, so there, there's that aspect, which I'm not, again, I'm not, I don't have the background to say, but I mean, you may be able to make a definition that meets certain qualifications to meet that uh, previous ventures uh, requirements. Um, that still is not the um, de facto <laughs> main, you know, m mega net uh, that uh, that um, that that you pursue. But I'm just I'm just wondering because we've seen a lot about this binary strategy, but um, it might be interesting to pursue these other kinds of strategies given the terrain the co-op is in at the moment. So again. Again, what I've been trying to say is that the strategy has never been binary, so that, uh, so that we're clear. It, the question is, when do you begin engaging the partners? So amongst the, hang on one second. So amongst the amongst the uh, uh, different milestones within the project, the important uh, uh, notion is that we are engaging partners all along the way. So it isn't binary at all. We begin. That's why I began the validator sale proposal in June, so that we could begin engaging with our partners. That's why we have DApps being developed. Um, are, are being funded uh, as early as January of this um, of this year, so that we have uh, partners who are engaging and building apps on the platform much earlier. Right, so it's not binary. The whole idea is that it shouldn't be binary. It should be that you're you're doing quality assurance as a co-development process all throughout the process. Likewise, you're doing the development of the partnerships much, much earlier in the phase of the, uh, of the development uh, um, arc so that um, you can engage each of these uh, 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 potential issues, risks, and set up the right communication pathways uh, so that when you are ready to transition, you can flip the switch. So it, neither proposal is binary and never was. That was the whole idea. And, and in fact, um, if you look carefully at the, the DAP proposal, the DAP proposal, uh, or the, the, the reason we were doing things with Reflective and Pythia and, and why we continue to uh, uh, want those partnerships and engagements is because the DAPs serve multiple functions all at once. First of all, they provide quality assurance against the platform. Anyone who's ever released a programming language knows that you don't release your compiler unless you've already built several applications that use the compiler. It would be foolish to say, okay, compiler's done, I, 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 I wrote all the code, and then expect the compiler to work correctly, or an interpreter, or anything else um, of, of that nature. Uh, uh, to work correctly without having um, built several applications that use the language and use the compiler. So first and foremost, the dApps are all about quality assurance. Second, they are about economic security and economic uh, assurance. There's a rich ecosystem of applications here that will bring transaction volume to the network, which brings validators, which brings security. That's crucial. Now, uh, with respect to the the, uh, the, propo the the different ways of thinking about mainnet, one of the issues that we have been kicking around or, or proposals that Jason Pleppel and I started kicking around on Sunday was what about pairing the portfolio companies with hardware providers? So there's an interesting idea um, because the portfolio companies uh, were always there also to provide um, a, back, uh, a backup plan if we couldn't get uh, nodes in place. 
Um, and the reason is because all the portfolio companies are highly economically motivated to run nodes. At a minimum, if they have a node that is operational under their control, they know that when their dApps make proposals, it at least goes into their node, which means it gets into, into the consensus. Uh, so at, at a minimum, uh, this is a nice backup plan. Now, they don't have uh, necessarily the wherewithal to stand up the kind of high-performance hardware, but they could be paired with hardware partners. And there's a nice uh, economic uh, uh, a solution there, uh, a potential that, that's related to the economics of those dApps. So this is something, this is a, yet another uh, a way to, to get to mainnet. Uh, but it's, it's never been binary. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay. So we're at 11.41. I know that, uh, that Kenny has some updates he would like to speak to. So I'm going to turn, uh, turn the, um, the floor over to Kenny. Thanks, Greg. Hey, everyone. I just have some quick things to share with you all. Can you see my screen here? I can. Great. So this is a little um, rough draft of a progress report that I've put together specifically right now for election updates, but this is gonna get a bit more um, nailed down in the next uh, few days. I might use uh, Confluence as well, so similar to Meta's updates, and so that they can be publicly available and, and you, know, you can take a look. So uh, just real quickly, I'm just gonna go over the uh, items of business that were all approved at the last election, uh, which was last, last week. So for financial transparency, this, this was actually already approved by the board. So this is already um, standing in the bylaws. So the first report will be due in January, 2019. And just to be more specific about what reports we're actually going to be putting out, these will be reports that actually do follow a, a, like a gap guidelines. So this is generally accepted accounting principles. The, the, the documents that you've probably seen and that we've been sharing are, are more like working documents for internal documents. These aren't exactly um, accounting documents, so they will be, and these will be put together by a professional uh, accounting firm, um, as well as additional audits and, and, and those other things that are in the um, financial transparency, but more updates to come, right? So an operational roadmap, um, I'll be the, uh, the point person on this. So this will be similar to this report here, but it will probably also follow some, um, some Gantt charts and some other things that'll make it a little bit more uh, readable and understandable for where the organization is headed, but it'll be similar updates on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. So conflict of interest policy, Barry Cinnamon has taken the lead on that, and we currently have a working draft. Uh, as soon as it is in a place where we can uh, have it go before the board, it will, um, it will be finalized and then put into the bylaws or at least um, approved uh, with a resolution from the board. Which, by the way, all of these items do get uh, any sort of, they, they get put into law by resolutions from the board. So the board will go through each one of these and actually have formal language for each one of them. Uh, so member participation in governance. So this would be some to define a process by which any important decisions would be, would have uh, community input. This would be something similar to the um, community input processes in local governments. So uh, an example would be usually when you're um, walking around, at least here in Seattle, and if there's gonna be a planned uh, demolition or any land use act, that they, they put up a sign and then there's a, there's a com the community meeting and the developers are given, you know, the community is, is given access to the developers to um, get, get feedback or uh, share environmental studies or, or whatever. Um, so we'll, we'll be going ahead and defining that process and then implementing it. Likely it'll be something in uh, GitHub style. So this would be similar to what, we use, what we'll be using for our, our chain improvement process. So this will be something like uh, our chain uh, request for comment, something like that, where item of importance will be, will be published. And then uh, within that single thread, there'll be uh, comment, comments just because uh, our Discord is not exactly good or set up for uh, staying on topic. Things tend to trail off pretty quickly. So the next one, uh, the monetary policy, this would be IOB5, the most um, most uh, talked about uh, item of business. So the there was one thing that was required within five days of passage, which is that these wallets be funded and they all have been funded with the amounts that are listed in that uh, policy. There are also other items and rules in there that need to be um, harmonized with existing uh, with our existing bylaws. For example, there's a uh, provision in IOB5 that says for the reserve fund, uh, 
right here could be accessed, but that would require a meeting, uh, a special meeting, and of that meeting, a two-thirds vote would be required of the members that show up to, to authorize any spending plan. So that likely is consistent with our, bar, our, our bylaws, but we do need to just double check with all of those. But there is one rule in there that says any interpretation must go through Jason, and likely that won't be adopted into the bylaws. But it will have some uh, modification, something like any interpretation or, or any of that matter will have member uh, consultation, not, not to the author directly, but generally membership. That would be just one example. Our chain improvement process is also in process, uh, or at least Meta has created a little space for it. it. hasn't been fully flushed out yet, but we do have a lot of um, examples for which to work from. And uh, if Meta is not exactly the direct um, lead on this, that she will be providing um, input on, on what that process will look like. And this will be this will absolutely need to be done before uh, mainnet launch, though all of these, of course, will be done within the next probably month or two months. And my next update, I'll, I'll start putting in timelines and dates for a lot of these to-dos. Uh, proposed bylaw amendment. So this one uh, will just be adopted at the November 6th uh, board meeting. So the language is already prepared. So that will just be an amendment to the existing bylaws. Last update is the, the two uh, board seats. So we had two resignations and that will be decided um, on November 6th by the, by the board members, the two new elected as well as the, the existing boards board seats and there are pretty much two decisions possibilities leave them vacant or or to find some process to fill them either by appointment or some other means so once that happens then we'll have an update there and that is what i have available now so if there's any questions i can go ahead and take those wonderful thanks for the update kenny uh, i'm wondering about the reserves um, is there any plan already how to implement um, in, in case it is compliant with the bylaws, how to technically implement um, the restriction that this is not being accessed with all two thirds of the memberships ships, uh, being come, say, saying yes on a special yeah. meeting? Let's, it's not exactly two, it's not two thirds of the membership. So what it is, the, the, the rule actually says that a spending plan will be created. It will be circulated to all members by email, likely. And then a special meeting can be called. So this would be the the, the board would just, or whoever, would, would call that meeting or that election. And of the people who show up to vote, so even if it's five people or whatever, five members, that there needs to be two thirds of that. So as far as I know, that doesn't conflict with any of our other quorum requirements, uh, but it is different. That, so that was just one example of, of something that- um, Understood. Yeah, it, it just, we need to look at each one of the rules that are in there to make sure that there isn't, um, conflicts. And if there is, then the board will do our best to uh, work with legal to harmonize those uh, those rules. But the, the actual final language, which will be in the bylaw or, or what will be adopted, uh, will have available for everybody to see. Yeah, it would be great to have clarity on this process. Um, what are the implications there exactly? Uh, this, this is not fully clear for me right now. Mm -hmm. Kenny, do we have... Uh... I asked Greg about this yesterday, but I would like your um, opinion as well as other board members through on this call. What is going to happen with the uh, rock that Pythia has in the reserve? I mean, their rock, their rock that since they're now, I mean, well, what we saw the other week was a formal resignation letter. And, and then I haven't heard anything from Pythia. We, we can't. Right now, that that whole thing is under under uh, negotiation, and okay. it, and and we cannot speak to that on camera here. Just can't be done. Got it. You, you can speak to Kenny privately, uh, but we can't speak to that on camera here. Okay. Um. I guess what is there a general sense of time and when that may be wrapped up? Because the last time th this whole thing was under negotiation, it was about a seven month process. I yeah, so, I, I, I have no idea, though. No I idea. Okay, but right. the situation now is different than it was then. Oh, yeah, I, I imagine so. Yeah. Um, and so the, 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 the strategy has changed. You know, I'm not going to, like Greg said, I can't really give many, many details other than the communication between the two organizations right now is is 100 percent through legal channels. It's not not direct at the moment. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, I'm sure other people are still wondering that. So if, if it's in legal channels, then that should be 
the message going out until something comes from the lawyers. Yeah. I have something to propose, um, and it may expose some of my naivete about this whole thing. However, it's worth trying. Um, <clears throat> we have portfolio companies, which are startups, and any startup has the problem, the inertia problem of anything that hasn't started yet. So lots of money goes into that, and there's a long time before <clears throat> profit is realized. However, there are companies out there that have lots of money for whom $10 million is no big deal. They're already going, they're already making money. <clears throat> How about uh, if we were to do something with this sexy thing called a blockchain that everyone wonders about, a lot of people aren't into it yet, no, haven't adopted it, find someone to partner with in a kind of a consultancy basis or in some way that, that uh, nails down some money put together a hit list and go after these companies and go after money. I mean, we can, we can be austere all day long, but it'll be like Nasruddin's mule, you know, experimenting with how little food he can feed him. And everyone hears about it and says, how's that mule doing? Well, he died. He, they say, oh, that's too bad, Nasruddin. He said, yeah, I almost had him to where he could live on nothing. Um, so I think we got to be careful to, to take a look at the other side of this, which is get more money in the door. And maybe everyone's doing that. I don't know. Yeah, Rudy, Rudy, this is Fabian speaking. I think there's a lot of people on deck that have been um, working their phone books and their contact lists to bring um, people to the table to look at the opportunity of, of putting money into the into the space. Well, so. I want to know about them, though. I mean, you telling me that's one thing. I, I great. But um, Rudy, I can. Yeah, absolutely. For contract. So first of all, I can say that there are, there are multiple eight figure contracts that are currently uh, in various stages of negotiation and pursuit. Not just one, multiple. Okay. Can I, can I tell you which ones? Not on camera. Yeah. And I, I, hope that everyone <laughs> understands, I hope that everyone understands as much as I really, really want to have radical transparency, the community put me at a terrible disadvantage in terms of negotiating at least one of these contracts. And I think they need to understand exactly all the, all that our, our potential partner has to do is to go look at those public records and know that they have the upper hand in negotiations. No, I, I get that, Greg. And I'm not saying that you should have to talk about things that you can't talk about. I'm saying that there is a wider world out there and there are ways, even with what's being done now, that more could be done. It's, it, you, you know. have the proposals. I agree with you. There's a wider world out there. I, I can find them. I mean, if I can get help on how to how to uh, pitch them, I can find them. We can provide you pitch decks, no problem. All right, man. <laughs> um, I would like to I would like to um, uh, support Greg in the importance of keeping negotiations with possible funders kind of close to the people that are doing the negotiations. Amen. Uh, I've seen I've seen a couple of things in Discord where uh, parties within the Archain community have publicly asked possible large funders publicly in front of everybody else for funding. That is really really just unprofessional as hell. Um, if you are reaching out to uh, possible contributors and believers in our projects do it quietly do it professionally but don't go blasting things out in discord about asking people for money that is just really crude that's happening a lot and it's a big problem that's happening a lot right now yeah and uh, i think that's just really really unprofessional and uncouth well, you know, unutter like. Yeah, everybody knows that, though, John. Well, evidently not, because it's happening. Not everybody, but enough people. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> and, and not enough people in, in our community understand what a disadvantage they put the co-op in, um, uh, in terms of negotiations. Uh, and it would be really, really helpful uh, if, the, if the community really would like to see the influx of capital 
from um, the sale of our technological assets that they could get behind that and support it. That would really, really help a great deal. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say on that matter. <laughs> know that Kate wanted to do some financial updates. So Kate, you have the floor. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. I, like Kenny, hope to be able to provide um, some metrics and numbers uh, week after week for you. Um, this week has been a lot of um, strategic planning and decisions. Um, I do want to report that um, we're in the process of meeting with contractors in an effort to reduce our monthly contractor spend. We're looking at taking additional um, measures in November, and November is going to be a transition month for us. Um, we're also looking at selling some assets. So, uh, again, it's um, I'll, I'll keep it pretty broad right now, um, Greg, if you want to dive deeper into any of these, feel free, but hopefully next week I'll be able to um, report on some, some actual numbers and metrics. Um, I know some members in the community have put together a financial question and answers document, um, and I'm going to, hopefully I'll be able to post responses um, in, in the next hour or so, but we do have a phone call today at two o'clock and I can post uh, the Zoom room for that. It'll be probably pretty short, like 30, 30 minutes, maybe 45, just to go over some of the um, financial Q&A from the presentation at the annual meeting last week. And that's about it for now. Hey Kate, could you um, post yeah. the URL for the um, Q&A? Yep, I'll go ahead and do that. Thank you. Okay, so unless there are any burning questions or comments, I'm going to suggest that we wrap it up here. Uh, Kate, could you post that uh, URL quickly before we close so that we can join? Are there, are there any updates from Reflective? Uh, no, we we are going to um, uh, move those out uh, in, in a different format. So we're beginning to experiment with different formats on the call, but we will get updates in, in the future. But for now, uh, we're we're focusing on updates with respect to the co-op's financial status until things stabilize. Thanks for posting the uh, Zoom URL, Kate. Okay, has everyone had a chance to get the Zoom in that is interested? Wonderful. Okay, folks, thank you again. I really, really value the engagement. I, I know that sometimes people think that I, I come off as a, a little insensitive or to people's comments, but please know that I do take them to heart. And we are working uh, to rectify the situation to make sure that we, we get to mainnet. Absolutely. We are, we're here to make sure that mainnet is delivered. I, I hope that we go to Venus, correct? Right? I think that's the vision we should look for. <laughs> and it, beyond. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So you, we're we're absolutely in agreement, and I 100. I know that if we get to February, we'll be just fine, just fine. There will be no issues with respect to capital. So, all right. With that, I'm signing off. Ciao, guys. Excelsior. Thanks. Have a nice evening. <laughs>